Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. We're going to wait for just a few, just one minute while um, our attendees um, join. My name is Elizabeth Rawls, and I'm the publisher uh, and editorial director of Atlanta Homes and Lifestyles magazine. We've been fortunate enough to have a wonderful relationship with Atlanta History Center uh, through the years. And I'm so pleased to be here today with Katherine Hugerwer and Sarah Robert of the Atlanta History Center. Um, as we get started with our webinar for Guizuita Gardens, Atlanta's Living Landscape. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Katherine Hugerwer, who is Director of Development and Events at Atlanta History Center. Um, and here we go. Thanks, Katherine. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. We've greatly appreciated our partnership over the years, and it's always a pleasure to work with you all. Um, I would like to introduce my colleague, Sarah Roberts. Sarah is the Olga C. de Gozueta Vice President of Gozueta Gardens and Living Collections. She has been with the Atlanta History Center for nearly 10 years and has led a period of transformation of the 33-acre public garden. Sarah received her bachelor's in horticulture at Berry College in Rome, Georgia, with a year on scholarship to study historic gardens and botany at the University of Reading, England. An internship at Harvard's Arnold Arboretum sparked a love of public gardens work, and she went on to become curator of herbaceous collections and outdoor gardens at the New York Botanical Garden for five years. She relocated to England again and completed a postgraduate diploma at Garden Design School. Sarah has written for numerous publications and has been featured on Martha Stewart Radio, Canadian Broadcast Channel, the Garden Smart TV series, and Stuff You Missed in History Class podcast. I am really glad to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Roberts. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you, Elizabeth and Atlanta Homes and Lifestyles for having me as your speaker this morning. I'm really grateful to be here. This has been a phenomenal partnership, and I hope next time we can do this in person. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, I've had the great privilege of working here for about nine and a half years, and what an incredible decade it's been. I'm going to launch right in, and if you have questions, please post them in the chat, and our host, Elizabeth, will bring your questions to my attention at the end of each garden on our digital tour here. I'm also gonna leave some time for questions at the end. You can go to the next slide. We're called the Atlanta History Center because we have multiple attractions. We were founded as a historical society in 1926 and moved to our current location on West Paces in 1966. That's when McElreath Hall was built to house the archives, home of the Keenan Research Center. Well, that is our origin, it's the museum and our exhibits that most people are familiar with, and the renovated facade is pictured here. This is the largest local history museum in the Southeast. We also have four historic houses, three on main campus and the Margaret Mitchell House, which is our Midtown campus. The largest and oldest artifact in the AHC's holdings is the land itself, traversed by indigenous people, shaped by early farmers, quarried by laborers and reimagined by architects, landscape architects, community leaders, and history center staff. All of the individual gardens and woodlands on the main campus were unified and named the Olga C. de Goizueta Gardens in January 2014, accompanied by a generous gift from the Goizueta Foundation towards infrastructure improvements to the gardens. To help bring all of our collections to light, we have a variety of day and evening programs on site and out in the community group and school tours, online content, imaginative interpretation, publications, and more. The History Center, with its multifaceted nature, is a particularly unique cultural institution. There are many historic houses that have a garden or a botanic garden with a horticultural library, but rarely does a museum have significant gardens as well as historic houses and an archive. One example is what we're known, one of the things we're known for is our Civil War collections. You can research that military history and life in Atlanta in the 1860s in the Keenan Research Center. 
explore the permanent exhibits and artifacts from this period in a museum exhibit called Turning Point, or experience the recently renovated cyclorama depicting the Battle of Atlanta. Then head outside to Goizueta Gardens and have an immersive experience at an authentic Civil War era farm, complete with historic buildings, heritage breed animals, and heirloom crops. These collections and this farm are just one period in time, one subject, one of the gardens. There are so many more to explore. Goizueta Gardens is a series of outdoor exhibits, an open air museum. The plants and animals in our care are the living collections. This is a 33 acre botanical garden with collections that support education, conservation, research, to create ambiance of a historic period and to capture moments of this region's agricultural, horticultural, ethno botanical and natural history. On top of that, it is a beautiful and peaceful place to get away from today's demands on our time and reconnect with nature. These photos are each of our signature named gardens. Each of these gardens have multiple layers of meaning and relevance. They tell the stories of how people have lived with and shaped the land that became modern day Atlanta over time. I'll walk through some of these gardens with you today and point out a few highlights. Before we step into our first garden, I want to acknowledge the debt of gratitude that we owe to Mrs. Louise Allen. I mentioned moving to our property in 1966. She was a trustee and first lady of Atlanta as the wife of former mayor Ivan Allen Jr. and made the case to preserve the iconic Swan House and Gardens when it was going to be put up for sale after the death of Emily Inman. The Atlanta Historical Society purchased the Inman's residence and the 24 acres that came with it. Mrs. Allen, who by all accounts was a force to be reckoned with, went about rallying the local garden clubs and each was given the opportunity to maintain different portions of the property. That was the beginning of the History Center's 54 years in historic garden preservation. The Cory Garden is the first stop on the tour. It is a repository for all plants native to Georgia and is one of the state's most diverse native plant collections. Its features include a small pond and buckhead branch, a creek which tumbles down a waterfall and runs down one side of the garden. This was part of the property that the AHS purchased. When a topographical survey was done to determine where to build McElreath Hall, they discovered this pit 30 feet below grade and filled with a wild tangle of native plants and invasive species. Members of the Mimosa Garden Club were part of the committee and decided it would be an excellent place to create a native plant collection and hired local expert horticulturist Eugene Klein to design the garden. This was decades before having a native plant garden was popular. It is naturalistic in appearance with woodland trails and plants mingling together in a variety of soil and light conditions that allow for a diverse range of Georgia's flora. If you can go to the next slide. Its history goes back even further though. It is called the Cory Garden because in the late 1800s to early 1900s, it was quarried for biotite nice. That's nice with a G, a metamorphic rock formed from granite that has the hardness of steel. It was primarily used for road substrates. Due to the time frame and the quarry's former owner, it is likely that mining that took place here was done by convict labor, a system of leasing county prisoners to private individuals for forced labor under inhumane conditions. The practice was abolished, and by about 1920, the quarry had been abandoned. Species moved in that could tolerate the full sun and thin soil left in the abandoned rock quarry. This repopulation by nature on a site that had its habitat destroyed by man or natural disaster is called secondary succession and ecology. We see this happen frequently when areas are clear cut and then allowed to grow back. Grasses and herbaceous plants grow first, then shrubs and trees become prominent. The tall trees that formed the cathedral-like canopy over the quarry garden were likely to have seeded in shortly after the site was abandoned, making them approximately 100 years old. Loblolly pine would have been the dominant species with tulip poplar mixing in, both still dominant canopy trees here today. Underneath these venerable specimens, you'll find a wealth of flora that is shade tolerant, particularly Georgia's spring ephemerals. These herbaceous plants are in a race against time to grow and flower quickly in the spring before trees leaf out and cast shade. 
They'll set their seed and retreat from summer going dormant. Bloodroot, cranesbill, trillium, these are just a few of the spring ephemerals that blanket the quarry garden in spring. The quarry garden with its deep collection of Georgia native plants preserves the flora unique to this state. In doing so, it also benefits the insects and animals that co-evolved with these species and require them for survival. In the next garden, Swan Woods, we narrow down that collection's focus. Swan Woods is about 10 acres of forest, preserved by the early efforts and fundraising of the Peachtree Garden Club. Like the Quarry Garden, there are many layers of meaning and history to be found here. First, this woodland gives a sense of place to this part of the state, to the Piedmont region specifically, which is the swath of Georgia between the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Upper Coastal Plain. It includes Atlanta and much of Middle Georgia. Woodlands can be read like a book if you look closely for the details. In this photograph, there is a V-shaped dip in the center. On the left is a flat terrace, then it tilts downward at 45 degrees and levels off again. To the far right, it dips again. These are abandoned cotton terraces. When residents here left to fight in the Civil War, the cotton fields were abandoned and regenerated through secondary succession, just like the quarry, only about 60 years earlier. Like the deep hole of the quarry, it's another mark of mankind that shaped Atlanta's landscape. The clear cutting and erosion had long lasting impacts on the natural environment, but as this forest shows, it will heal over time with careful stewardship. Careful stewardship does not mean solely preventing bulldozers and development. It also means managing the invasive growth of exotic species. This is what Swanwoods looked like six years ago in a remote corner with difficult access due to the sloping terrain. It was choked with primarily English ivy, but also Eliagnus, privet, mahonia, and bamboo, all species which were brought here from Asia as ornamental plants and are still sold today, despite the ecological havoc they wreak on our native ecosystems. This is the same space today. We're seeing native plants generate from the seed bank left in the soil, but we must constantly monitor and remove the rampant Asian species. Sometimes this is something we do with our garden volunteers, among many other activities. And here we have the wood cabin, once occupied by Elias Wood, dating back to at least 1830 in some parts. Dr. Carl Hartramp Jr., a descendant of Elias Wood, donated the cabin to the History Center where it was relocated in 2014. To rebuild it, log by log, when we had to open up a section of Swan Woods for access. And as you can see in the next slide, it meant we had some bare ground afterwards. We took this opportunity to show what the early stages of secondary succession look like. The grasses and the herbaceous plants that begin that process of renewal for a forest ecosystem. Within a few years, we were able to breathe life into the compacted soil and create a wildflower meadow. The wildflower meadow helps support our native pollinators and create a place of wonder and enchantment in the late summer when it peaks and bloom, only a few weeks from now. We will continually pluck the tree and shrub species out of this meadow to keep it in its current state and not allow it to become a forest, which it would do in short order if abandoned. At the lower end of the meadow is our apiary of four honeybee hives. We harvest the honey that bees don't require and use it in programs for tasting, cooking, and adding to drinks. The last hive we harvested from had about two and a half gallons of honey. Honeybees are European. They were brought to our shores in 1622. They have about a two mile range from their hives, so they forage from the entirety of Goizuera Gardens. There are, I believe, 532 other species of bees which are native to Georgia. These species are dependent on finding flowering native plants from spring through fall to survive. So we make every effort to have the right species of native flowering plants every month of the year. By providing a high quality habitat for insects, we're also supporting insectivorous birds. We are a certified wildlife sanctuary by the Atlanta Audubon Society and host four bird walks per year. Also tucked into this meadow, along with our hives is the trial orchard of American chestnut hybrids. This species once dominated the eastern forests of this country, but were devastated by chestnut blight, a parasitic fungus that was brought in on imported Chinese chestnuts. 
Our educational orchard has hybrids that are 15 sixteenths American and 1 16th Chinese. That 1 16th provides blight resistance. And I'd be happy to take any questions on that if time allows. Next slide. You can enter or exit Swan Woods on our new boardwalk made of black locusts and native hardwood. This is an ADA accessible path that for the first time opens up this part of our campus to all of our visitors. We were using it in spring to accommodate hundreds of school children each day who are learning about the Trail of Tears because of course this land we occupy now was once Creek Muscogee territory. Throughout any of our native plant collections, plant labels make note of how indigenous people of this region utilized plants as medicine, food, religious purposes, and other materials. If you head this direction down the boardwalk, you'll end up with an iconic view in Atlanta. This beautiful home was commissioned by Emily and Edward Inman after their Grant Park residence burned in 1924. They tapped the architectural re firm of Hence Reed and Adler to design their new home in Buckhead. Reed drafted the initial plans, but died before a final set was approved and Philip Trammell-Shatzi rose to the occasion. This stately home and the garden was completed in 1928 towards the end of the country place era movement. Its European character, formality and opulence are hallmarks of this period. Shatzi had studied in Rome for five years and this his seminal work has calling cards of that Italian influence. The strong axial or linear landscape that drives your eye up the hill to the Italian villa multi-level lawns, statuary, urns, and symmetry. Swan Woods encapsulates the estate on either side. This very formal garden relies heavily on evergreen infrastructure. At the front, clipped trifoliate orange hedges flank the entrance of the drive, and autumn olive or eleagnus hedges create a framework around the broad terraced lawns, separating this manicured landscape from the wilder woods beyond. And if we walked up the main drive, we would get to the front door of the Swan House. Around 1900, waves of classical revivalism were sweeping the world of architecture. Studies of Italian villas by Charles Platt and Edith Wharton appeared and were quite influential, particularly among the wealthy. This was a response against informal landscaping and coupled with the trending classical revivalism led to many reproductions of historic landscapes, particularly French or Italian. Because these classically inspired and geometrically complex landscapes needed professional designers to create them, they appealed mostly to people of wealth. These were also the people who could afford to travel widely and study classical references, hire qualified designers, and had the acreage required to appropriately balance the large homes with corresponding landscape architecture. They had the means to hire the staff to maintain these formal landscapes and also staff the interior. These homes demonstrate socioeconomic status and sophistication. Note that this side of the house has a more restrained aesthetic. That is the influence of Emily Inman. She requested that study, that Shetzi study, the work of two Englishmen, Lord Burlington and his protege, William Kent. They were both heavily influenced by the 16th century Italian architect, Andrea Palladio. Schatzi himself wrote, as to the landscaping, whatever has been done was with the Italian garden in England in mind. As you walk around the house, you'll come to the Boxwood Garden. The Boxwood Garden is modeled after monastic gardens in Italy. There is religious symbolism in its layout, which is in the shape of a cross. A central fountain is a common element. This garden has been renovated and happens to be the only part of this landscape for which we have Shotzi's original drawings. In addition, we can always reference historic photographs. Next slide. This is 1933. Those boxes would look pretty old for a house they'd only lived in for five years. That's because they purchased boxwood from people's residences that had an inst to give them an instantly aged look as if they had always lived here. This side of the home is a little bit more exuberant. It shows statuary on the top of the house, which are summer and fall. 
there were four originally, the round window on the third floor, a double horseshoe staircase, and the cascade fountain. Originally, this was all turf here in the front, and Emily Inman hosted parties here and served mint juleps. But with being open to the public, we've had to adapt to heavier foot traffic, and I laid out this gravel path to make it more visitor friendly and to be able to host weddings and events. These kinds of decisions to change a historic landscape are not done lightly. There is a team of us that discusses this kind of change, and one factor is always, could we put it back to what it once was? And that is why we use a material like gravel rather than flagstone. This is Emily Enman. I like to show these old photographs whenever I can for context of this era. And why not if you have an archives only 100 yards away? Edward and then passed away after only living in the house for three years, but Emily lived in Swan House until her passing at age 84 in 1965. This enduring legacy of inherited fortunes and talented architects have left a long lasting impression on the landscape. It captures an entirely different moment in time than any other landscape within Goiswater Gardens. And I just want to check here. Do we have any questions at this point that we want to bring up before I move on to our next garden? Sarah, this is Elizabeth. We did have a question from the audience. Um, is the garden allowing volunteers at this time? We are bringing volunteers back in. We have, uh, we had halted during the pandemic, but I think it's actually starting next week. We're starting our garden volunteer program up again. And so anyone who's interested, um, I can provide my email address and put you in touch with our volunteer director. We set up tours and do get some paperwork started. And then we will be bringing our volunteers back. Yes, we'd love to help. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another question, um, did Mrs. Emily have tours of her home before she passed? That's a great question. I don't believe she did because she was very private, but I can follow up on that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Oh, sorry, Sarah, one more question. Are the original boxwoods gone now? Have they been replaced? That's, a, that's another one, um, great question. Many of the original boxwoods are still there. The ones that are along, if you go one slide back, Catherine, um, the boxwood that you can see at the house foundation are original. And on the other side, you can see them there just around the horseshoe staircase. On the other side, which is around the fountain, all of those boxwood got boxwood blight. And we went through a very strenuous process of removing all of those boxwood, removing all of the leaf litter of boxwood blight, which is a fungal spore that can live in the soil after it's done with your boxwood, burning the soil, and then replacing all of those with a little leaf holly that looks a whole lot like boxwood. So the idea was replacing the diseased plants that can never recover once they've had boxwood blight and you cannot replace boxwood in a setting where it's had it before because it will also catch the disease. But the holly is completely immune to boxwood blight. So we prune those to get them to look like the original intent was from Shotzi of this evergreen billowing pillowy mounds of boxwood around the fountain. And Sarah, what are the shrubs other than the boxwood? And can you also speak to the type and the color of the pea gravel? The pea gravel is Wisconsin cream, and it comes from a quarry in Alabama. The other shrubs in the Swan House landscape, there is not a lot of diversity here. This is more of a static and historic landscape that is being kept as it was intended by Shotzi. There are roses as the primary flowering element where the evergreen shrubbery is really um, the driving influence in this garden, that evergreen framework. So it is year round, it looks mostly the same. The roses are Lady Banks roses. They're yellow and they flower on the handrail that goes up and around the horseshoe staircase. And there are white Lady Banks roses that cascade over the walls. Additionally, there are two obelisks further down on the cascade lawns, and those are American pillar roses, which are a raspberry red. In the boxwood garden, that particular boxwood species I'm asked about a lot because it's very small, and that is a Korean species of boxwood called Justin Browers. Behind that is running bamboo, which we are always running after to keep it in check. Several of the plants in Shotzi's plans were ones that would grow rapidly. So we have wisteria standards, we have uh, bamboo, and we have Eliagnus. All of these are invasive species. 
So we have to work very hard to keep them in check, to not let them get away. But it also speaks to a challenge that Shotzi faced, which all landscape designers face today too, when your client wants something that is going to grow rapidly and look like it's an established garden quickly. And so those fast growing species, species were utilized. Um, and Sarah, are the gardens open to the public for walking tours right now? Yes, we are open to the public. You can buy a ticket at our online on our website, and then you can show the ticket on your phone. And it, we also have a digital map that you'll be able to open up on your phone. Uh, so all of the gardens and the museum inside is open. The historic houses are mostly closed because it has to do with how much air circulation you can get and how we could keep that safe. But if you are going indoors in the museum, you are required to wear a mask. And Sarah, going back to um, the Elias Wood Cabin, we have a question. How long has it been there? And um, they're wondering where exactly it's located. This particular um, attendee has been to the History Center many times but has not seen it. Okay. So next time you go, um, if you go to that Swanwoods boardwalk at the base of the Swan House lawn, take the boardwalk and it will go straight to the cabin. It is in the very far back of the property. And I say very far back, it might take 10 minutes to get from our front door to the cabin, but you have to know which way to go. So cutting across the quarry garden, down Swan House driveway, and then up the boardwalk. So the cabin is inside of Swan Woods. Was there another okay. part of that question? Um, we were okay. asked if there is a map that we could show how all of the gardens connect. I can pull that up. When we finish this, let me pull that up off of our website and I'll do a screen share. Will that work? Okay. okay. Great. All right. So the next garden I'm going to go to, and I'm sorry if you can hear all my mouse clicks, um, pretty noisy mouse, is the Smith Farm. There's a, this is a house that dates back to about 1840. The, uh, the Smith Farm does. It was rescued from demolition when the city was putting in highways and executive parks in the late 1960s. It was brought to the History Center campus in 1969. It's a good example of plantation plan architecture and what an upcountry Piedmont slaveholding farm would look like. It was once an 800 acre hog farm. The earliest photograph we have of a house is this one from 1886 during reconstruction. The house had survived the Civil War intact and this photograph shows the original owner's grandson and his wife. The children up in the foreground, which is a little bit hard to see, are believed to be the sharecropper descendants of the 13 to 19 emancipated slaves that were previously owned by the Smiths. Next slide. This is the farmhouse today. The house, all of the outbuildings, fields, and gardens surrounding it that complete the farm is about as different as you can be from the neighborhood we are currently surrounded by, which illustrates the disconnect of our current use of plants as purely ornamental and the former connection of working the land for food to surviving on what you could grow. This is a very affluent area, but even our definition of wealth has drastically changed. The last descendant that lived at the farm was Tully Smith. She said that she knew they were well off because they had a two-holer, and she was referring to the privy. Next slide. There are several garden spaces at the farm, which is all ensconced within a Piedmont landscape. This is the kitchen garden, food crops grown for the Smith family. We utilize our resources at the Cherokee Garden Library, the old seed catalogs, the Southern Cultivator, and more to find what crops were grown here in the 1860s or prior. We've discovered some methods too, which are interesting, like hilling up the rows about a foot off of ground level, which is really a precursor to today's raised garden beds. The soil will warm up faster in the spring and it drains better. We've learned how to table tomatoes, which you can see in the bottom right corner. Tomatoes are a tropical vine. They can be trained up through a lattice and then allowed to sprawl across the top. Peas are staked with branches and cucumber frames are woven together from pliable woody shoots pruned off of mulberry. We grow foods here that used to be a more common part of our repertoire in the South, like parsnips and leeks, but people don't grow them anymore. Um, we're keeping those traditions going and cook with those old recipes over the hearth and season. We'll teach how to braid garlic or string up green beans to store as leather britches for winter consumption. The 
This view is from within the enslaved people's garden, and it demonstrates one of two typical gardens that might have been allowed by slave owners at this time. If you were allowed a garden, it was either a communal plot for all of the enslaved workers to share, or a smaller plot for that cabin's workers. This was one of the first major renovations that we did nearly eight years ago now. Many common crops came to the southeastern U.S. from Africa with seeds tucked into folds of clothing, such as tania, which is pictured here with the large leaves, peanuts, black-eyed peas, sesame, and eggplant, all from Africa. This is a good example of where we've utilized our research center for sources and puzzling out the various common names from 150 years ago to today's current name and to try to get the right plant and the right variety that was available in this area. We also use a lot of enslaved African narratives and oral histories to help us determine what would be historically appropriate. You'll see the fencing is different in this garden because they would have used found materials rather than the pickets, which you can see in the kitchen garden in the background. It's also a different style of planting. Enslaved people were only able to get into their garden at night when their other jobs were done. And when one plant came out, another went in. There were not neat and tidy rows. There was a jumbled appearance with multiple layers of vines, perennials, and native herbs for medicine, and taller crops all mixed together. We can use this garden now to demonstrate a healthy vegetable garden that creates an environment for beneficial insects. These are insects that eat the pests, like aphids, and how all of this was done organically as they had no other option. These are um, foods that were grown and eaten that did not have to look perfect. And today, even our peaches, they always have brown spots and we cut those out and they make just as good of a cherry pie, peach pie. The enslavement story in the South is a painful one and it has to be interpreted with care. We want everyone to feel welcome here and to have a quiet place for reflection or a conversation with one of our interpreters. The last major area of agricultural crops is the field. This is where we demonstrate cash crops like cotton, which is shown in the foreground, and dent corn in the back, which would have been used to feed both people and livestock. Both of these crops are heavy feeders and very labor intensive. It depleted the soil of nutrients, pushing the farmers to clear cut more and more land for fresh soil. This led to a lot of erosion and loss of topsoil in the region. Due to the current pandemic, we have pivoted from growing crops for educational demonstration and are now in full production mode. Emily Roberts, our director of urban agriculture, has built a partnership with Concrete Jungle, who we donate all of our produce to. They package it up and bring it to people in Atlanta that do not have access to fresh produce. By next week, she will have donated over 500 pounds of produce to people in need. There were about 200 acres of cultivated land on the Smith farm and another 600 acres of woodland where the Smith's hogs would have roamed. Being in the city of Atlanta, we are not allowed to have hogs. However, we do have other heritage breed animals at the farm. The sound of buying fills the air from both the sheep and the requisite echo from visitors as they walk past the barn. We have four Gulf Coast sheep. They tolerate our heat and humidity and two Angora goats. Both of these are heritage breeds kept in Georgia before the 1800s. The sheep would have been used for spring lamb or mutton as well as wool, but the goats were grown strictly for their fiber, angora. We do not harvest anything but fiber from any of our ungulates. We also keep poultry, Rhode Island red and Plymouth rock chickens, which are dual purpose breeds. This means they were kept for both meat and egg production. We get about 130 eggs from our six chickens each month and maybe another 40 from our two turkeys. The naturalistic setting surrounding each historic building at the farm is all native Piedmont plants that were carefully selected and grown from seed to recreate a natural looking landscape and create the appropriate sense of place. It also serves a dual purpose of slowing down rainwater and preventing erosion. Growing food feeds not only our bodies, but also our souls. It helps us reconnect to land in a very tangible and productive way. Farming as it came about in this period made an incredibly large impact on humanity and a huge footprint on the land across the South. If anyone is interested in knowing which heirloom fruits, vegetables, and herbs that we grow, I can send you a document with those listed. They've been around since at least the 1860s. They may not have that much disease and pest resistance or be as productive as modern hybrids, but they frequently do have a better flavor. 
And from here, only a two minute walk away is an entirely different garden altogether. Honoring the life of Goizueta Garden's namesake, Olga C. de Goizueta, known as Olguita by her friends and family. This ornamental garden is designed for the enjoyment of flowering and fragrant plants, a place of beauty for quiet reflection amid the hectic pace of city life. The first, this was the first new garden added to the campus in over 30 years. The architectural design was by Mark Mosley and Alex Smith, and I did the planting design. The garden's design and planting scheme reflect the strong European influences on our southeastern landscapes. This is the location selected before Olguita's garden was constructed. It is between the museum and the quarry garden, which is off to the right. Next slide. And here is that same space in its first spring after construction. This formal piece of the garden is a classically English double border, but a version that has been adapted in plant selection to grow in our climate. The borders are backed by fragrant tea olive hedges, clipped boxwood topiary repeat down the border in urns. Italian influence is also felt in these formal parts of the garden with a structure provided by walls and columns, transcending the garden into an extension of architecture. Italian influence spread across all of Europe and is prominent in the English landscape as well. The English perfect structure in the garden with rooms, clipped topiary and hedges that provide contrast to lush and billowing plantings. Slide. The planting scheme here is carefully selected for successional bloom. The foxgloves shown here are a key spring bloom in this garden for seasonal color particularly picking up where the violas and tulips leave off. Their dramatic vertical spikes last for about six weeks. When they are finished blooming, they go in the compost and the tall perennials in the back fill in. Salvias and dahlias are tucked in later in the season for supplementary blooms. Foliage color adds additional depth, such as the purple smoke bush here and the silver lamb's ears at the front of the border. At the end of the double border is a limestone terrace with faux bois concrete furniture by Curry and Company and pots by Long Shadow. We have the cushions made in a coral fabric called snakeskin begonia that blends into the overall color scheme of this garden. As you look back down the border to the other side, the view culminates in a focal point of limestone columns designed by Atlanta architect Neil Reed that had been donated to the History Center. The columns stand within a reflective water feature with a backdrop of rare and mature fall flowering camellias. The water feature brims with water lilies and lotus and they're in full bloom right now. Climbing thornless Peggy Martin roses grace the columns. Peggy Martin is a resident of Louisiana whose garden was flooded during Hurricane Katrina. Only two plants survived the inundation of two weeks of salt water and one was this old rose. Cuttings had previously been shared with Dr. Bill Welch at Texas A&M, who in turn created a fundraiser out of the sales of this rose to assist with rebuilding gardens devastated by the storm. I mentioned the color palette earlier. These are just a few of the plants in this garden, but they represent the general color scheme. When I was working through planting choices, I called Mrs. Goizueta's florist, Michael Evans, and we discussed her love of antique color shades, soft corals, pinks, lavenders, pale blue. This rose at the lower right is a David Austin rose named Rolled Doll, which has really proven to be a great performer with old English blooms and strong fragrance. If you're not familiar with Lilium regale, the central top image, it's five to seven feet tall and full bloom with multiple trumpet shaped blooms per stem and is also highly fragrant. And that's one of those plants that bridges the season after the foxgloves finish and provides an additional vertical element to the garden. This just gives you an overhead view of that double border and the water feature with uh, the roses growing up the columns. And that is a sneak peek of somebody's wedding. The amphitheater is just behind the limestone patio and that's where school groups gather for lunch or where we host cocktail parties or a museum theater. We utilize it during our candlelight nights program. Many opportunities. 
And if you turn around while you're standing on the amphitheater and look back towards the patio, this is the view that you would get in late evening because we do have uh, light uh, features in the garden. So I have one more stop on our journey here, but does anyone want to ask any questions at this point about Olguita's garden or the farm? Sure, we did have a question going back to the Swan House. Um, okay. First about the bamboo and then second about there was a plant that you mentioned called Elian Agnes. Mm. Um, and then lastly, if you could tell us about the painting in your background. <laughs> this is by one of my favorite painters. She's a pastel artist, Tara Will. And we have the Olmsted Plain Air Painting Competition every year. We've been a partner with that group and they come and paint in Goizueta Gardens. And that is the uh, terrace. Actually, if you go back one slide, Catherine, that might give you a reference point of what we're looking at in the painting. <laughs> um, she has a website that you can find more of her paintings there. Eliagnus at the Swan House. Uh, the Eliagnus is the variety Fruitlandii, and that is the second time, the second hedge of Eliagnus. The first, when they first bought the property, it had run into the gardens. They had one gardener uh, when the History Center bought the property, and it was way more than he could maintain. So they ripped out all of those Eliagnus, which had grown way up into the canopy of the trees, and replaced them with this Eliagnus Fruitlandii. It is a double hedge, two rows of Eliagnus, and it takes three weeks to prune them all. Oh, I can start. I can see one question. The hedge, the hedge in Olguita's garden is osmanthus. It is tea olive, osmanthus fragrance. And the shrub behind the foxglove was Catinus cagigria grace, which is a beautiful red purple foliage, grows very fast. It's a great plant if you like pruning because it will need nipping back every now and then to keep it a little bit more compact unless you want it to be 15 feet tall. Um, See. Do you sell any of the seeds from the fruits or vegetables grown on site? We'll do you one better. We'll do a seed swap. So when, uh, when we have our programs again, when we're able to do that, we do save our own seed and we will have a table at those programs and we will give it away or swap seeds. It's a great way for people to exchange their heirloom produce and would be more than happy to, to share any of our seed, except for cotton because there's a permit license on that. And what is the hedge bush in um, Olguita's salvia and dahlia colors? Let's see the head. So let's go back a few slides, Catherine. I can't see what slide. There we go. Um, salvia and dahlia colors. So all the all the colors are in these antique shades of corals and pinks and lavenders. Uh, I have a list of twelve dahlias that we have used here that we picked up from Swan Island dahlias, which I think is in Oregon. Um, the hedge is Osmanthus um, heterophilus. It's a hybrid, actually, it's a hybrid between fragrance and another species. So it is fragrant, but it has a very handsome and spiky leaf, uh, which helps keep people from cutting through it when it is young. And Sarah, um, do you have any trouble with deer or other animals eating your plants? We have transient deer. Because of our location and our lack of fences, when the deer come through the neighborhood, they come through the gardens just like everybody else's house, but they're not there all the time. We've had them bedding down in the quarry garden. We've had them eat the roses at Swan. And most tragically, they nailed the chestnut orchard about three months after we planted it. So all the trees had sprouted and were about an inch tall, an inch, a foot tall. We had them in cages and they, pushed the cages over, got the hoof underneath, pulled the saplings out, and ate all the chestnuts. So that's the thing about chestnut. Everybody loves them. So we ended up having to get more nuts from Berry College through our partnership with the American Chestnut Foundation and replant the orchard. But that is the only huge loss that we've had. Uh, we, we have a lot of wildlife in Guayzueta Gardens, and this pandemic has, has brought them all out of the woods, literally. We have a family of foxes that live at the Swan House. They have a very Tony address, and there are four kids in that family that are still running around the campus and starting to get territorial about who lives where. 
So it's an adventure every day to see what is gonna, what we're gonna find tomorrow. Uh -huh. And where is the chestnut orchard on the campus? It's down there with our beehives. So if you take that boardwalk out to the cabin, the wood cabin in Swan Woods, the beehives and the chestnut orchard are to the right at the end of the cabin. There's a big landing platform where you can have a view up to the cabin, up the hill and up the wildflower meadow and then off to the right. There's no path that goes down there. There was, but some of our bees have gotten very aggressive. So we mixed the path just so nobody accidentally wanders down there and gets stung by bees. So there's no path, but you can see the hives from the boardwalk. And you can see, sorry, the chestnut orchard as well. There are five American chestnuts, five Chinese chestnuts, and 30 of the B3, F3 hybrids, which are those ones that I spoke about that have just 1 16th of Chinese genetics. Okay, and then one last question before we move on. When you said you compost the plants in the spring, I assume you're clipping off the tops so that the roots remain? With our foxgloves, we take the whole thing out. Uh, they will, if it was a personal garden at home, I would let them go to seed and let them reseed and maybe half of them, I would just cut back that flowering spike because sometimes they'll perennialize and come back for three or four years. But in Olgita's garden where we have a limited amount of space and we want maximum impact, we will remove the whole foxglove. It is a biennial and it has done the majority of what it was gonna do by the end of its flowering season. So we start with new foxgloves planting them in the fall every year for spring bloom. Um, our compost, just to let y'all know, because it's not something included in here, is all done in-house. It is something that a part of our sustainability program and a way of being a little bit greener on our campus. We collect all of the coffee grounds from Brash and the produce from Super Jenny, uh, from all of the salads and everything that is made before it goes out to customers. And all of that goes into our compost system as well as our own green waste from the farm or our tomato vines and everything else. So all of that goes to a horticulture facilities area uh, that is not open to the public where we create gorgeous compost, super caffeinated, highly vegetable based compost. <laughs> but we use it. We've used all of our compost. We put 20 tons of compost in Algeta's garden when we built it and probably an equal amount in the entrance gardens. Do you sell any of the compost? We don't, because we use it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and sorry, one last one. Um, please repeat the holly species that was used to replace the blighted boxwood and the soil prep necessary. Yes. OK, boxwood blight question. The boxwood has to go if you want to do what UGA extension will tell you to do. They would say remove the infected boxwood and remove both neighboring boxwood. Completely dig it up double bag it, throw it in the dumpster. Do not compost it. That spore will live in the soil for at least seven years. So you can remove some of that soil or you can burn it, which is what we did with a tiny flamethrower. Very exciting. We were also wearing hazmat suits and it was very hot, not a pleasant task. But we sterilized that earth and then said, never again, we're not going to plant boxwood right back here because it will just get reinfected with blight. So we replaced it with a little leaf holly it's Ilex Emerald Colonnade. I believe that's a registered or trademarked name. This holly is one that came out of UGA. It's one of their introductions. It is a fantastic substitute for boxwood. It's a great question. I'm glad you asked. The main difference is it will grow a little bit more in an oval, an upright oval shape, whereas Buxus sempervirens, which is called American boxwood, even though it's from Asia, will grow in a low, mounding form. So all we're doing is pruning that growth that's shooting up a little too high. We're taking it down to just recreate the complete effect of those billowing boxwood. So Ilex Emerald Colonnade, and you can find it out there in the trade. And Sarah, what is the lavender plant in the middle of the image that's on the screen right now? Lavender in the middle. So I've got a hydrangea there, hydrangea macrophylla, Give me a second. Which one is that? I have three in that garden. I think that's twist and shout. But of course, that the pH of your soil is going to affect the color of that bloom. So the more acidic it is, the more blue it's going to be. Okay. All right. We'll keep going so we don't run out of time, I guess. Last 
garden destination on our grand tour is the entrance gardens. Pull it up on my screen as well. This wraps around our property from Andrews Drive to West Paces, where our main entrance is, all the way around to Veterans Park and Slayton Drive. This particular section shown here is the renovation in front of McElreath Hall. We have many different buildings on campus from the brutalist architecture here to very modern curves and glass on the museum. What I wanted to do with this landscape is put together a cohesive landscape across all of our entrances that suits the architecture, is attractive, and also supports our local ecosystem, a garden that you would expect to recognize some of the plants in the Atlanta area. So that means gardening with primarily natives, without synthetic chemicals, with boatloads of compost, and having some design elements that are repeated across that range to make it cohesive. This design style is informed by the new perennial movement, an aesthetic that draws on a naturalistic meadow appearance, but it's, it's idealized in, in terms of its flowers and its form. The style has been made very popular and it's not really new per se. Its most famous champion is Pete Aldolf in his work at the Lurie Garden in Chicago or the High Line in New York. One design element that I repeat um, in this garden is using clipped trees and shrubs for structure, particularly as a strong geometric form. So in this location, it's the 12 foot tall hornbeam hedge that I've put in against the building. Those are actually five individual trees that we've pruned into that shape to create that effect. This provides a sharp line and a foil to the softer, broad and naturalistic perennial planting that moves in and around these more static shapes. In this side, you can see where I've used Yopon holly in a clipped ball form in three different sizes. And I've threaded Mexican feather grass throughout that to wave around with its soft texture. There's also cone flowers in here and Achillea. And that's in our bus parking lot. There's a reason that can't be beautiful as well as functional. Up here at the main entrance, this is where Brash Coffee and Super Jenny are located. This is where the garden really comes into its own. The beds are deeper, there's more space here, and it's quite a large installation. There were over 10,000 perennials that we planted in this landscape up front. Another aspect of this style of design is using large drifts of perennials, groups of 15 to 60 of a kind. I have 600 of one kind of grass in this garden and you weave them in and out of each other, repeating some plants in that garden throughout so that you have a, a sense of rhythm, a rhythm that carries through. Another piece like that plant I mentioned we have 600 of is purple love grass or Aragrostis spectabilis. It's a native grass and it creates a frothy, foamy bloom only about 12 inches to 18 inches. That's called a matrix plant in this style of garden and you spread it out over a large area and then you can come back in with your more decorative perennials and plant them inside that matrix of grasses to provide you the textural contrast and a, a cohesive thread throughout the planting. It also layers the planting. So some plants grow low and wide and others are dotted in, rising up either in groups or scattered as if they were just seated around. Next slide. This is the longest, sorry, Catherine, back one. I went too fast. This is the longest bed in the garden in front of the Texas locomotive, and it shows an unusual plant called Monarda punctata. This is a native perennial. It's highly decorative with whorls of lavender flowers that then drop off and they leave these green ping pong ball seed pods that last the rest of the year. And this is key to this style of gardening. You really have to shift gears if you're thinking of a gardening in an English aesthetic to gardening in this style. Here, we don't cut plants down or deadhead them after they finish flowering. I selected plants specifically for how they senesce into fall and winter. So in other words, do they die well? Do they have upright stems? Do they have interesting seed pods? Do they have good fall color? These are all just as important as the flower in this style of gardening. Because you're not deadheading, you're not tidying up all year. You're letting plants do what they do naturally. And we're learning and training our own eyes as well as our visitors and Buckhead in Atlanta that there is another style of garden design out there 
It's a more naturalistic style and it's a more ecological style of gardening. Let's go to the next slide now. This is a mix of plants that are in flower right now in front of the cyclorama. This photo demonstrates another aspect of this kind of design. You're not always choosing plants for how the colors look together, although this I think came out nicely. What I was going for was the contrast of flower forms. So I have these spires of the blue agastache, blue fortune, and then I have the cone flowers with that bright orange cone and the drooping pink ray petals, and then daisy shapes on that dark purple vernonia or the ping pong white ball forms of rattlesnake master. And you can see some of those forms repeating throughout. And in the back with the big pink corums of flowers is Joe pie weed. And I love talking about the native plants in this garden because so many of them go by such and such weed. Why are they called weeds? They're beautiful, they're native. And the reason why is because all of these plants were named as colonists came over here and looked at this flora through a European lens. So that was Joe Pye weed. And we have many other, other plants as examples that are called weed, but I think you can just call it Joe Pye. It's native, it has a right to be here. It's not a weed and it's very ornamental and a huge pollinator magnet. Next slide. Cone flowers I, I used throughout this whole landscape. I love coneflowers. Goldfinches love coneflowers. So do bees and butterflies. There's, there's a lot to love here. They have broad textured coarse green foliage that contrasts really nicely with grasses or fine textured plants in full sun. And then those cones look like little spiny hedgehogs in fall and winter. They turn dark brown or black and goldfinches come and pull the seeds out of them. So you get these beautiful bright yellow birds coming to visit and they're already um, being spotted out in the gardens now. But that's one of those plants that dies really well. So you get nice green leaves in spring, a beautiful flower in summer, attracting pollinators, it's native here, and then that strong stem, and they will fade to these, those black orbs. And those are very decorative in fall and winter when you have a lot of asters and grasses and other things, and then this little uh, dot of black throughout the landscape. Next slide. So this style of gardening, cone flowers, liatris, panic grasses. These are not revolutionary, but I really do want to encourage nurserymen and gardeners, master gardeners, horticulturists, everyone to look at a broader range of species that we can grow as ornamental plants in our landscapes that are also native. This is Allium sarnuum or nodding onion. It is a favorite of bees has a lot of nectar to provide and has a beautiful bright white flower which shows up really well in the evening and I've just mixed it in here with that purple love grass, the aragrostis underneath it and it's been in bloom for weeks and as a real highlight it's very pretty in person I think better than in this photograph but that's just not one that you'll find at the nursery so you have to really look for specialty native plant growers to get these plants out there. My dream, my hope, is that people will visit this garden, see these plants, and start creating a demand for them at their local garden center. Next slide. This gives you a little bit of the atmospheric effect of this garden. When the light is low and slanting through these gardens, it's really beautiful. And you get an idea of what those cone flowers look like. There is just a haze of calament or uh, calamenta nepeta variety nepeta, which is white. It's going to flower for about five months. It just goes and goes and goes. It needs full sun, well-drained soil. The only thing I know that kills it is a really wet, soggy winter. So um, that's just another kind of long view of that central bed in the garden. And the last one of the garden pictures that we're going to look at. Next slide. So the last thing I want to share with you is this crazy idea that I had about February 2017, there was a large white oak that was in decline and I was really sad to take it down. I wanted to do something with it, honor its long life. It was about 140 years old. So I wanted to do something cool with it and we desperately needed more seeding around Goizueta Gardens. So I, did try, I decided to try and make it into an enormous table in its tree form as if you slid it from branch tips down to root flare and laid it down. I already had the perfect spot because I wanted to not plant under these mature trees and entrance gardens. This is right behind 
that billowing landscape protected with two sculptural serpentine and evergreen hedges. So you're, you're boxed into this space and protected from West Paces, which is just on the other side. And this, uh, this is the, the end result I'm showing a picture of here, but we took the tree down in eight to 10 foot sections. We had advisors, we sealed the ends so it wouldn't dry too fast and reduce cracking and then took it to a local sawmill owner and had it planed into two and three inch slabs. We then stacked it up for two years in our parking deck and let it dry. We had a lot of patience with this project. We finally got it down to about a 14% soil moisture, sorry, wood moisture content. Luckily for us, uh, next slide there, Catherine, local expert woodworker Kirk McAlpin III was willing to take on this complicated project. So we inventoried, we measured each piece, and I began the design of the table. I had templates made of the larger slabs to use as tabletops, of which there are 15 in all. And these were useful in laying out the design up there on that site because I needed it to thread between the existing trees that were in that location and, and change the angles of how it would branch in order to accommodate more seating. Kirk began the enormous undertaking of bringing that raw lumber to life over a period of seven months. Together we fine-tuned that table design as he progressed, adjusting angles and edges based on the conditions of each piece as he went. Each piece was hand planed, shaped, repeatedly sanded and finished on all sides with numerous layers of an epoxy resin and varnish that is used in boat building. And here you can also see the bow ties that are used uh, and crafted in there so that the wood cannot crack any further as it expands and contracts in the weather. The next slide will show you the quality of that finish. It is glossy and gorgeous. In total, there were 36 slabs of oak utilized and finished to, to a very high quality. The entire tree table is made from that one white oak that we had to take down. One tabletop, in fact, shows the decay inside the tree. It's a very dark stain where it just kept soaking in more and more of the epoxy resin into that softened wood. Then there were all of the benches that we had to make and what I wanted to do was match the remaining pieces of lumber that we had from the tree as best as we could with the curves and angles around each of the tabletop species. Tabletop slab. So while Kirk worked his magic with the oak, um, I worked on the next step, which is the concept design of the table bases. I ended up favoring a weathering steel and what I learned is called a sled design. And this gives a stable flat base no need to dig through all these existing tree roots it would have completely defeated the purpose if we'd had to put in a bunch of footings. This also gave us the ability to attach those benches to the table's structure for security and have a minimal appearance so the focus would really remain on the oak. A local fabricator called Fascinate was used to make the to take those templates of each of those tabletop pieces and the benches, they took them to their shop and we fine-tuned those dimensions to get them accurate for each unique table base. And finally, this is a view from the branch tips and looking back down the tree. The garden staff made these, we call them logettes, the tree stump seats, which accommodate seating needs where the branch angles were too tight for benches. We clean it every single day right outside where we have brash coffee and super jenny and the day we opened it, we had, we've had people there ever since, socially distanced and picnicking at the table. So all of this is open. You can walk right in off of West Paces and come see this. Um, the entrance is not far past that where you can show your ticket. If you'd like to explore the rest of Goizueta Gardens in real life, uh, we would love to see you. So thank you very much for hearing me out today. Those are our hours, Tuesday to Sunday, 9 to 4, and our website. And if you have any questions, I will take those while I try to pull up the map of our campus to share. Thank you so much, Sarah. This is amazing. Thank so you. neat. Um, I did want to say that we, the History Center, has kindly um, offered to give away um, a free pair of tickets. Um, and so Susan Farrar, um, I see that you were on here. Um, I will be in touch with you um, and Catherine as well to redeem those tickets. Um, we also have 
um, a free copy of the History Center's um, History Matters that I will put in the chat box right now, as well as um, free access to the digital issue of our most recent Atlanta Homes and Lifestyles. It's on the newsstand right now. Um, and then we will get to questions. And I have the map, which I can share. I think we have to stop share on the thank you page and then I can share my screen, I think. We'll find it. Let's see. And it looks like it's going to share. Here we go. Does it come open? Can you see the Goys with a Gardens map now? Yeah. Okay. So in the green, the other side is the museum, both floors. And if you can you see my cursor? Yeah. Okay. So here's our main entrance. All of this here is part of the entrance gardens. And our parking deck is right there, free parking. Uh, the entrance gardens continues all the way down this side and up to McElroy Hall. So this whole landscape is entrance gardens landscape. If you walk through the museum and go into some of the exhibits and galleries and come out the back side here, this is all Olgita's garden. This is the very formal part with the walls and the fountain in the amphitheater and it extends over to this side as well. And many people start their journey on this loop around the gardens by going to Olgita's garden and then looking over the Cory garden over this, um, this ravine edge and then joining, um, joining up over at the Smith farm. So here's the barnyard with the animals and the blacksmith shop and all of these little outbuildings and vegetable gardens. You can then traverse up to the Swan house here where our foxes live. And there is Boxwood Garden, the Cascade Fountain, the long terraced lawns, and this axial view of the Swan House landscape from Andrews Drive, which is down here. And all of these trails represent trails out on Swan Woods. And this is the boardwalk with a little hash line through it. And the wood cabin is here. There is a restroom right here. And then the chestnut orchard and honeybees are down here below the restroom facility. All of this is more of Swanwoods Trail, and this is that, that blue line is Buckhead Branch, the creek that runs through our whole property. If you come down the boardwalk and take your photograph, your selfie at the Swan House, you can then go in the Asian Garden, which is one I did not bring up today because we just don't have enough time to do it all. But there's the Asian Garden with our uh, Japanese maple and hydrangea collections, and then the rhododendron garden with a whole bunch of azaleas. And then you would come back out um, and if you want to go down into the quarry garden, you can get right back in there from here and do the whole loop. I'm sorry, I had a question about, two questions about butterflies. Um, is there a reason why there are, it's not a butterfly garden um, at the History Center? Because the whole place is a butterfly garden. And so when you have native plant collections of this magnitude, and this is one of the state's largest native plant collections, you are supporting all pollinators. So the honeybees, they get all the press. And that's why I mentioned the 530 plus native bee species. There's also wasps, flies, um, butterflies, moths, all kinds of other pollinators. And they, many of them are attracted to the same species. They all have different mouth parts. And those mouth parts evolved specifically with flowering plants that grew flowers in those shapes for those insects so that only they would get the nectar and not something else that would waste its energy, its pollen and its nectar. So that's why I always emphasize why we need to include native plants in our landscapes. Our native pollinators depend on them. So if you build a butterfly garden, you are also going to get bees. If you build a native meadow, you're going to get both and birds and maybe something of the mammalian variety running around in there too. And so are any of the flowers or plants labeled in the garden? Person after my own heart, whoever you are, uh, my background, that, that part of the Arnold Arboretum was in plant records. And we have just, uh, we're waiting, it's taking a while, but we have 233 labels for the entrance gardens uh, that, are, that are coming in and we will be placing those. We have at least one, if not two, for each species. 
within the entrance gardens landscape. We have labeled all of the plants in Olguita's garden as well. The Cory Garden has some labels and the rest, uh, there's just a smattering in the Asian Garden and the Rhododendron Garden. The rest do not have labels yet. We are working on a living collections management plan, which includes funding from the Goizueta Foundation to increase the number of labels that we have on our plants. We are also working on an interpretive plan. So none of this information that I'm sharing with you now is available to read on any interpretive panels in the gardens. So what we wanna do is have these histories, these stories, these different layers of meaning and relevance for each garden out there and easy to access. So we're working on getting interpretive panels out there and the plant labels are part of that plan, kind of like the, the label of a museum object inside. That's what they are for us on the outside. Okay, we also have several requests for a list of some of the plant names, um, especially the native perennials that you've been discussing. Is that a possibility? Absolutely. So I can, we can break down a list by garden or by native plants or entrance gardens might be the easiest way. I probably showed the most there or in Olkita's garden of specific plants. If that helps, would you prefer a Olkita's garden plant list and then entrance gardens plant list or any other areas in, in particular? I have a couple of requests for those and so I can get those to you um, okay. after afterwards. Um, a question about what was the iris in the entrance gardens? Iris in the entrance gardens? Let's go look at the picture. I have a few. There's blue flag iris, iris virginica, and there is a variegated iris, iris insata variegata, which is Asian. They have beautiful white and green foliage and dark purple flowers. Is it that I, or either of those? Does that answer the question? Let's go back and look at my pictures. Any other questions for me? I'm gonna end my screen share here so I can see the chats. Do your joy-eyed peas fall over from their weight? Say that again? Do the joy-eyed peas fall over from their weight? The joy -eyed peas. The weeds? They don't, and I'll tell you why they don't, because that is not the straight species. I have three species of Joe pie weed in the entrance gardens. The big ones that were in the photograph that was really floriferous is one called Gateway. It gets about five to six feet tall for us. So it does not flop over. It has very thick stems and that has been fine. But if yours are flopping over, if you have a, the native wild species that gets nine feet, all you have to do is prune them. I, I call it the Chelsea chop or go out there in May and cut them in half. Don't be shy. They're going to come right back and they're going to, that one stem is going to put out a bunch of buds, throw up a bunch more branches and they're all going to flower and they will make a little bit smaller flowers so they're less likely to fall over. And do you have milkweed varieties at the garden? Yes, we certainly do. We have many varieties of milkweed. All of the native species are ones that we either have in Swan Woods or in the entrance gardens or in the quarry garden based on where we have soil conditions and light conditions that work. There's one called Asclepius incarnata cinderella that is a nice newer form with um, white flowers, I think, or is that the pink one? Ice ballet is white and cinderella is pink. Both of those are great uh, larval but, uh, monarch butterfly or other butterfly host species. So you'll see them nibbling away on there. And that is a, I'm glad you brought that point out because it's something I, I like to tell people is shifting the way that we look at herbivory from insects damage on our plants. Instead of looking at your oak tree and thinking, or your, your Asclepius and thinking, ah, oh, you know, somebody's eaten this plant. I need to put a chemical on it to get something to stop eating it. We have to start thinking of that as success, that we fed an insect. That insect, if particularly caterpillars, might become a butterfly. And if it's some other species, that caterpillar may well have been eaten by a bird. Birds only feed their young, soft-bodied insects. And so we desperately need caterpillars in our landscapes. It takes at least 30 caterpillars a day to feed a baby bird. And if you have five nestlings, that's a lot of caterpillars they have to bring back to the nest every day. So don't please um, use harsh chemicals that are broad spectrum and kill all insects. If you see some insect damage, 
maybe try to find out what bug it is first. Send it to your extension agent, see if you can identify it. It might be something beneficial that you want later on in life. And it's oh, great. Thank you, Sarah. We have reached our time limit. We appreciate your time today. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, this was wonderful. And we will be sending out a link to this complete video um, on Monday, as well as links to the History Matters catalog um, and the digital issue for Atlanta Homes and Lifestyles. We hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much.